lullaby. My inability to express myself is astounding. It is not curious or even faintly interesting, but like some fathomless sum, a number, a number the sum of equally fathomless numbers, each one the sole representative of an ever-ripening infinity that will never reach the weight required by the sun to fall. There is nothing on the ground to pick up and examine. It is too far back among the leaves to reach. And here I am walking idly, passing it from below, with only a faint breeze to remind me there is anything there, the merest rustle of which quiets me down to the point I am able to sleep at all. Happiness. Summer, late evening, my friend, the sunset, to surprise me, took the most interesting streets. Late he was, longer than ever before. Sequoia. I keep some moss in a bowl, tiny unreal deer there looking out over the hills for some water. At the black glass lake, alone at the edge, I stand shaking myself out. Didn't think to bring a towel. Um, this is a translation of a poem by the ninth, ninth century Chinese poet, Pu Shui, uh, who was, while he was alive, much beloved in Japan and also for many years afterwards, would be fair to say. And I first encountered this poem in the Corcoran Gallery, I believe, uh, or somewhere. Um, it had been copied on a Hokusai print by Hokusai. Crows and storks fight over something to eat, and sparrows over where to sleep. You stand there all alone by the pond. The wind blows and snow piles up. The Butter Festival. You can have all the other sadnesses, the yellow leaf on the burnt path, the silverware hopelessly scratched, the evening news and the morning news, the funeral, the rot gut, the crappy tag sale the dead fish seasoning the shore, the memorial, the wake, the Ono no Komachi poems, all of April 1998, the Lunar New Year murder, English as she is spoke, and the attempt to resist an inevitability that you yourself created. The 14th way of looking at a blackbird is mine and a couple of other sad experiences rolled into a ball of pie dough as an object lesson in fragility for the Butter Festival. Maria and the Halls of Parish. She loved dandelions but hated the circus. She wanted to know where eggs came from, really came from. Where came the body of the body of the body they came from? And when her heart made that sad little oboe note, she wanted to know where the mind came from and was as answerless as if she sat in the middle of a beginningless river. Rock, explosion, dust, light. Reminded her of the time the toy factory blew up. And she found a little clown on the shore, and then another, until she was determined to find them all, the whole shebang, though she never did. And night fell over the ocean, and eye-popping children of all ages slept in a sleep brimming with irresistible attractions, giving them a taste of what awaited them when they awoke, though it was nothing compared to the massive arrays of adulthood. Cracker Bell. I grew up. I became myself 
and was haunted by it. And I love to wander, utterly alone, listening to the sound of tears, striving to guess my own secret and racking my imagination for a dream. Meanwhile, everybody else knew my story, and there was not one of them who would give me so much as a bird dropping. So on I wandered with arms and nitric startled eyes, nitpicking my way through the world, when the electrical current that runs in all directions deep beneath the earth shook me. And at once I felt there are so many years to fail that to fail them all, one by one, would give me a double life, and I took it. I think that so many of you were late, and they, they said that there were train um, signal problems on the train. I like to lean forward when I read, and I'm trying to adjust this, as you can tell, so that I can do that. But it, um, and so I thought I would read this because it has uh, something to do with that. Midnight Express. I smoked in profound silence, wondering what would come next, but nothing came next. I am not what is called a woman of imagination, but I am not without a certain psychological insight, and I think I might have been dwelling in the realm of gnomes engaged in hoisting false signals and misplacing switches for the Midnight Express. And now I feel a pause, and now I jump over it with sudden indescribable tenderness, as if actually bending over a cradle. And now I feel I am on my way. Now I am in my machine, the road rolling beneath me, behind me, in front of me. And it is no imagination that I picture you in your machine, or reading, or washing your clothes, though it is perhaps this one hour you have chosen to make a list of all the acts you are ashamed of, or the ones that came to nothing through no fault of your own, so that you sit quietly and in great silence like a gnome on a stump, one of the older ones smoking a pipe filled with bewilderment and regret. Tuna and a play. Tonight, we are having tuna and a play. Earlier, I picked grasses with Jay. Blue grass, pink grass, silver grass, we each carried a bouquet. I asked Jay if she was glad to be a human. Jay, are you glad to be a human? But she couldn't say. She walked through the grasses for what seemed like a day. I thought I saw her face turn gray, but it was no more than a moment in a very nice day. And tonight, we are having tuna and a play. The Friend. Once while walking in the woods, my friend and I found a bright orange newt. We looked at him kindly, then went on. Out of the night, my friend said, it pays to be the friend of a newt. And indeed it does, indeed it does. The years have shown me that. <laughs> Lorraine, once I had a plum tree. It was small but sturdy, and every April I threw its petals into the stream. They intoxicated everyone, even the postman. Even the postman knows I am more homesick than E.T. and lonelier than my middle name. I live with mice and bats where once I had toy cars and paper airplanes. Like a wild swan with a blue shadow, I no longer care what I say. You no longer exist. I try to remember my dream, but as soon as I turn on the shower, it's gone. <coughs> Solomon. Who tells you what to do? 
in your dark little house, how do you know, each one of you, just the one form which you are to take? How do you know the one spot you are to occupy in that confused something which is forming in front of you, in back of you, all around you, silently, swiftly taking place, forming a more and more complicated looking moment, meaningless at first glance? Who knew? Nothing doing, except the ice in the trees bringing the stars to earth, and a candle crafted for my own personal pleasure by nice people in Wingate, North Carolina, who had another brilliant idea, adding nuts to soap. How did they know life escapes philosophy in a little bag of protoplasm? that it is possible for a revolutionary to love flowers. For an hour, I read about another man's childhood, and so long sequestered outpoured the old strangely remembered, every fat particle of it able to transmit an owner. I tried to make new the never-ceasing cry of the mouth, and my friend sat with her hands in her lap so I could study them. Every creature in divine sleep begins to dream of obscure love. So be not afraid of horses reading in the moonlight. Be not afraid of people you see in the street. Each carries a cloud whose weight is distributed among us. I'm going to read an essay. It's called My Private Property. <clears throat> it is sad, is it not, that no one today displays any interest in the art of shrunken heads. Men, women, and children walk on streets, they cross fields and enter forests, they run along the edges of oceans, but none of them, to the best of my knowledge, are thinking about shrunken heads. I am thinking about shrunken heads, but keep the thought to myself, that is, inside my head. For if the subject is raised at all, it is met with horror on account of the violence involved in the necessary removal of the head before you can shrink it. But as an art and a conception, the tribes of the Amazon displayed a genius that deserves our awe. Miniaturizing and preserving a human head is a glory and wonder on the scale of the Great Pyramids. I recently encountered a passage on shrunken heads in Kontiki, the best-selling account by Thor Heyerdahl of his journey with five companions on a simple wooden raft that set sail from the coast of Peru in 1948 and landed on an uninhabited South Sea island 101 days later. The journey, which even professional mariners thought would end in disaster, was undertaken to prove Heyerdahl's theory that Polynesia was settled by peoples of the South American continent. It is not a book that is much read today, but the copy I found at the Goodwill was in its 21st printing in 1962, so it is fair to think that for many years people did think about shrunken heads, which are mentioned in passing on page 62. By 1948, when Heyerdahl and his men were building their raft in a naval yard in Lima, the market for shrunken heads was strictly an illegal one but there were still people who made their living selling the desiccated top portion of the human body. The Amazonian jungle is very dense, and such a thing is hard to control. Heyerdahl's account is brief and sketchy, but one learns it is done like this. 
After the requisite decapitation, the skull is smashed and removed through the neck, leaving the skin of the head intact like a sack of flesh, which is then filled with hot sand, which causes the sack to shrink without losing its shape or any of its features. The shrunken head is about the size of an orange. One of Thor's men, who had lived in the jungle a long time, had a friend who was murdered and whose head was shrunken. A promise was made to spare the murderers in exchange for the head, and so the little head was eventually handed to its widow, who fainted. Thereafter, it was kept in a trunk where it mildewed and from time to time had to be hung by its hair on a clothesline and left in the air to dry. Every time its widow saw it, she fainted. One day, a mouse got into the trunk, and that was the end of the head. To be eaten by a mouse. To be eaten by worms is charmless and inevitable, but for your head to be nibbled at by a mouse, for your head to become a bit of moldy cheese on a plate, that was something that spoke volumes about reversals of power, about foolishness and vanity. It reminded me of an 18th century Japanese drawing I had once seen, mice transcribing a book by Kanawabi Kosawa, in which red-eyed white mice wearing kimonos are kneeling at a low desk transcribing a book, while off in the corner naked black mice are devouring the pages of all the books that have been transcribed. Am I vain to think of my head as a book? Am I not transcribing the book of my head as I write? To be eaten by a mouse, I had to learn more. So I did some research and found a more detailed account of how it is done, a method used by the Havaro Indians of the Ecuadorian and Peruvian Amazon, who, as far as I can tell, are known today as the shore. These ethnocentricities become amazingly complicated. The Havaro, or shore, slit the head flesh up the back to remove the skull, throwing the skull in the river to appease the river gods. The eyes and the mouth are sewn shut to paralyze the spirit, which, having died violently, would be bent on revenge. The flesh head is boiled for two hours until the skin is dark and rubbery and one-third of its original size. The skin is then turned inside out, and any flesh still sticking to the inside is scraped off. Then the head is turned back, and by this time it resembles an empty rubber glove. The final shrinking is done with sand and hot stones dropped one at a time through the neck opening, constantly rotated inside to prevent scorching. The sand enters the places the stones cannot, the crevices of the nose and ears, and hot stones are applied to the exterior, too, to seal and shape the features. Surplus hair is singed off and the finished product hung over a fire to harden and blacken. A heated machete is applied to the lips to dry them, and then they are lashed together with native fiber. The word for shrunken heads is sansa, and the process has been in existence for as long as anyone can remember, an art so old it has no known origin. It takes about a week, a week to shrink a head, the artist working daily. A ceremony follows where a string is inserted in the head so it can be worn around the neck, for the head of the slain enemy is a trophy, a living trophy of sorts, for it contains the spirit of the vanquished. Some tribes, though, didn't keep the heads after the ceremony, but fed them to animals or gave them to children as playthings to be lost. In this instance, they are dolls, but with a difference. They are real dolls, every girl's dream. It is hard to fake a shrunken head, but once they became a commodity, enter the white man, many tried. Some clever folk used other animals altogether, such as the heads of monkeys and goats. Where there is value, there will be experts, and experts say that nose hair and ears are especially hard to fake. An expert examining a shrunken head to determine whether or not it is real is not unlike an art expert examining a supposed Rembrandt to determine whether or not it is real. Magnifying glasses are used. But I keep thinking about the mouse. 
who didn't care or know if the head was anything other than a real meal. We eat jerky, don't we? Most of all, I like the idea that a head can continue to have a fate after it's dead. And the story of the widow who fainted every time she saw her husband's head on the clothesline took me back to my own first encounter with a shrunken head. When I was 16 years old and in school in Brussels, I would very often play hooky, skipping school it is also called. And always when I did, I did the same thing. I took a tram to the outskirts of the city and wandered through that marble mausoleum called the Congo Museum. I may not have been a writer at 16, but I was most emphatically a daydreamer and felt deliriously happy to be free, wandering under the hanging canoes, staring at the stuffed elephants and peering into the eye holes of masks with which I felt I had a special relationship. Of course, I am filled with retrospective shame, but not for my feeling of freedom. Freedom is something one should never feel ashamed of, but for my sheer and utter ignorance. I can now say that my ignorance was not in any way caused by my absence in the classroom. I can assure you my school did not teach what I now know to be true, that the museum I wandered in was built on rape and plunder and pillage and oppression and murder, and everything in it was stolen, that the very wealth necessary for such acquisition was stolen, wealth acquired by force of so filthy and unspeakable an evil our heads cannot fathom it and have no single word for it, but must resort to endless corridors of words, each corridor turning into another corridor a thousand miles longer than the last in our hopeless search for some inner chamber of understanding that does not exist. Among these millions of words, time passes, and in time, slavery passes, if only on paper, a page shuffled among thousands of pages. And then there are two words, rubber and ivory, that break off from the others and river around the world in the form of automobile tires and piano keys. But commerce and culture quickly lead us down a corridor leading to more automobile tires and more piano keys and their equivalent money. And I want to go the way of shrunken heads and dolls, soft rubbery flesh and ivory-like porcelain, skin and bones, faces and masks. At 16, I was not much the other side of dolldom, so it is little wonder that there in the Congo Museum, I fell in love with a shrunken head. Of course, the head was not Amazonian, but African. I don't know how the art evolved on that continent, but genius flourishes everywhere. It has always been so and will always be so, and there will always be people who believe otherwise. As I said, a shrunken head is as close to a real doll as one could ever come. And in this sense, it is both a child's toy and an adult's toy. It's another person after all. And I was not then, nor am I now, immune to the charms of having someone else to play with. He was dangling from an invisible thread, much like a spider does, from the top of a glass case taller than I was. He was the size of an orange. He was particular and unique and human and utterly real, a man with eyes and eyelashes and hair, It was only later that I learned that the hair and eyelashes do not shrink with the flesh of the face, and so the shrunken often have the luxurious eyelashes of a child, and the hair is much longer than the face, though often cut, so great is the human impulse toward proportion. But my man had long, uncut hair, and as it was 1969, I didn't think anything of it. All the men I liked had long, uncut hair. His skin had the sheen of an eggplant. It must have been oiled, and all the purples of that fruit were in it. His nose was broad and flat, his eyes deeply set, unnaturally so, and beautifully shining. But so many years have passed, I cannot be sure of what was there and what was not, though I returned to look at him countless times. He was, after a while, what I came to look at. And at some point, I began to commune with him. Yes, 
I gave life to an inanimate object, but can a human head ever really be said to be an inanimate object? He was not a skull. He was not decomposing. He was not mangled in any way. He had been and was a person. I don't remember what it was we communed about, but he possessed me as I possessed him. And to possess the head of a beloved, no less than the head of an enemy, is the greatest sickness on earth. I could enter the museum blindfolded and turn exactly the right corners one after another to find myself standing before him at eye level. I shall never forget his expression. He looked startled. No other word comes to mind. And though I could not see myself, I must have looked startled too. We stood facing each other the way when you come upon a deer unexpectedly, you both freeze for a moment, mutually startled. And if that, in that exchange, there seems to be but one glance, as if you and the other are sharing the same pair of eyes. The years passed. I left the city. I never returned. The signage in the museum changed. Of that, I am sure. But the impression left upon me by the shrunken head has never changed. So that I now wonder why human beings do not incorporate the art of shrinking heads into their burial rites. I am serious. What prevents us from saving the heads of the dead we bury, since we can make them the sizes of oranges or apples, and keeping them out of the deepest love and respect for our descendants, for whom the heads will become ancestors? For what are ancestors but the loved ones of our loved ones, since a single act of love down through the ages has procured what we call the future I am presuming, of course, that procreation involves love, which it very often does not. And so I hesitate to say love is the greatest traveler. I could just as easily say sex. Perhaps love is but symbolic behavior toward sex. It is certainly symbolic behavior toward the living and the dead. I am most interested in shrunken heads as symbolic behavior toward the dead. Marks of being a human involve symbolic behavior toward the dead. No other animal does it to the extent humans do. Don't we carry photographs of the heads of those we love who have died? Don't we frame their heads and keep them on the mantle as a reminder of all that is precious and binds us to this life? And before there were photographs, that rage of the well-to-do, that sign of commerce and culture, there were hand-painted miniatures, if you could afford them exquisitely detailed renditions of the head, kept in a protective locket or box that could be carried inside a jacket or coat. Someone leaving on a long journey would carry such a head. A Belgian officer or intrepid explorer would carry such a head into the African jungle. Surely Commandant Donis, afterwards Baron, making his way towards Katanga, carried such a head. And surely from time to time he took it out of his coat or jacket and looked at it. And his heart was filled with love, even if that love did not extend to the foliage around him, nor to the people whose habitat it was, several of whom were artists in shrinking heads, no less than the miniaturist. The human heart is hard to fathom, no less than the human head. They both contribute to human behavior, the hardest of all to fathom. I don't know when psychiatrists and psychologists were first called shrinks, but the term has stuck. I confess I don't understand it myself, for my personal experience with psychotherapy is that it expands the head in wondrous ways. It educates the mind to view itself and others from new perspectives amounting to vistas. There's nothing small about it. I first began seeing a shrink after the death of my mother. I was then in my mid-40s and considered myself highly intelligent. A large part of my intelligence depended on my total ignorance of how ignorant I really was. I was not unlike Commandant Donis, the Belgian aristocrat who carried a miniature head into the jungle without realizing the Congolese were far superior in that art. Even today, when I muse about preserving the heads of loved ones by post-mortem shrinkage, I am ignorant. I seldom stop to consider the obstacles and absurdities of my plan. My mother's head, for instance, for example, could not have been shrunken by any means. 
as she died from injuries sustained in a gruesome accident, which resulted in her head during the few remaining weeks of her life swelling to inhuman proportions. My mother's head went rather quickly from the size of a head to the size of a watermelon to the size of a prize-winning pumpkin. It was impossible to look at it, her, unless you pretended you were watching a horror film and that it wasn't real but a giant grotesque doll created by special effects. At least that is how I remember enduring one such viewing. Unlike a shrunken head, when a human head is enlarged, it cannot sustain its features. The eyes and the nose and the mouth all disappear in one gigantic gelatinous mass. Such a head does not remotely resemble the person it belongs to. So much so, I pinned a photograph of my mother over her hospital bed so that the doctors and nurses might know what their patient looked like. It seems strange to me now, the gesture of that photograph, as none of the, other, as none of the medical staff knew her before her accident and there was no hope at any time that her head would deflate to that of a recognizable person. I think I pinned that photograph up for myself so that I could remember her as I knew her. No, my mother's head, sadly, could not have been shrunken by even the greatest artist. And yet, her head has always figured into my daydream of having 12 shrunken heads, each one belonging to someone who has passed through my life, touching me in deep and unforgettable ways. And I would keep my dozen heads in an egg carton made especially for them, 12 beloved heads kept safe and together. I would never let them mold or rot. I would not let the mice near them. Their fate would be to remain exactly as they were in life, exactly as they are, albeit orange-sized and portable. And from time to time, I would take them out and look at them and be startled. And I think of the widow who fainted at the sight of her husband's head, and I think if I could hold the head of a single beloved in my hand, I would indeed feel faint, but I think also I would get used to it. I would grow calm and be moved in the tenderest of ways. Just the sight of them there in my hand, resting gently and safely, a shrunken head cannot be broken. With such tiny and shining eyes, why resting gently and safely with such tiny and shining eyes, it would be as if they were but babies returning to live again, and I could touch their faces. I am ashamed to think of the baby heads as my private property, but I do. It has been said that inside the human head is to be found the only freedom that exists for all, but very often that freedom grows lonely and bored and frightened and yearns to join another head. Very often owning one head is not enough. Owning our own head gives rise to the desire for the head of another out of the perfectly natural desire for love and communion. But out of greed, out of the desire for control and power grows a monster the desire to own as many heads as possible. None of us are immune. Who doesn't want more clients, more patients, more customers, more readers? But desire can swell to inhuman proportions. Thus the king of Belgium declared a vast territory as his private property and all heads within it, including, unbeknownst to him, all the shrunken heads, heads shrunken after a week's worth of artful work. I don't really know anything about heads, though I spend a disproportionate amount of my time thinking about them and more time ever since seeing a shrink. I am not even sure I own my own head, but my innermost fantasy is to own 12 beloved heads nestled in an egg carton to comfort me in moments of dearth in exchange for my infinite love. How can I call myself benevolent? I want, as my personal private property, 12 human heads. I have often thought of God needs prayers to remind himself he is important and still matters. Without our interceding glances, what would he be but a shrunken head on the end of a thread in a museum of ideas? Sometimes I think there is no place left for me to go but back to the Congo Museum, that horrific monument of smashed lies and beautiful things, and stand face to face before a face I can barely remember but do and pray to that shriveled thing that when I die, as I must, let someone preserve me as I was then, that first day, ignorant, innocent, at my most beautiful, and overcome by another. It occurs to me 
I wanted to die that day. Why else would I have skipped school and wandered off alone and found a friend among the dead, one who thrilled me to life? Oh, my pantheon of shrunken heads, struck like new laid eggs in a carton, comfort me when my rivers are high, comfort me when my waters are gone, for I can almost hear you breathing. Thank you. <laughs> These poems, these poems, these poems, she said, are poems with no love in them. These are the poems of a man who would leave his wife and child because they made noise in his study, she said. These are the poems of a man who would murder his mother to claim the inheritance. These are the poems of a man like Plato, she said, meaning something I did not comprehend, but which nevertheless offended me. <laughs> These are the poems of a man who would rather sleep with himself than with women, she said. These are the poems of a man with eyes like a draw knife, hands like a pickpocket's hands, woven of water and logic and hunger with no strand of love in them. These poems are as heartless as birdsong, as unmeant as elm leaves, which if they love, Love only the wide blue sky and the air and the idea of elm leaves. Self-love is an ending, she said, not a beginning. Love means love of the things sung, not of the song or the singing. These poems, she said. You are, I said, beautiful. That is not love, she said rightly. So that poem is by Robert Bringhurst. Uh, I'm going to read quotes and poems by other people. I wish I'd written that poem. I didn't write it, but I wish I'd written it. Uh, and often when I want to have written something so badly, I will memorize it. I tend to expunge my own poems from my mind, uh, but remember other people. So I'm going to recite a couple of poem, other poems by other people tonight. It's wonderful to be here and wonderful to read with Mary Rufel, whom I've admired for many, many years, and only just met this evening and published for, for many years. Uh, I forgot my second book, but I'm going to read a, I'm gonna, I think I can remember this poem. Um, I think the world has forgotten my second book. I doubt any you poor bastards out there have a copy of it either, do you? Um, I lived in Prague. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move around the world. I've lived in a lot of places, and I lived in Prague the year after the Velvet Revolution. And it was quite a different place then than it is now. I lived with someone at the time, and we lived uh, in one of those grim gray apartment blocks that surround so many Eastern European cities, Paniloks, they're called in Czech. And uh, we lived there for $35 a month, uh, which, of course, is not possible now, those of you who know Prague. Um, it was a grim apartment, but we were on the seventh floor, and so we had this in very romantic, incredible view of the city, and one day, when I was studying Czech, do not speak Czech to me, I will not understand, but I was studying Czech at the time and, and uh, my girlfriend was in the bath and this falcon landed on the windowsill. And 10 years later, after she and I had gone our separate ways, I, I wrote this poem, it's called Poštolka, and Poštolka in Czech means falcon or kestrel. If I mess up, I'm just gonna go with the next poem. When I was learning words and you were in the bath, there was a flurry of small birds. And in the aftermath of all that panicked flight, as if the red dusk willed a concentration of its light, a falcon on the sill. It scanned the orchard's bowers, then pain by pain, it eyed the stories facing ours, but never looked inside. I called you in to see, 
And when you steamed the room and naked next to me stood dripping as a bloom of blood formed in your cheek and slowly seemed to melt, I could almost speak the love I almost felt. Wish for something, you said. A shiver pricked your spine. The falcon turned its head and locked its eyes on mine. And for a long moment, I'm still in. I wished and wished and wished the moment would not end. And just like that, it vanished. You can see why I would be drawn to that poem, these poems. Uh, we choose our miseries a lot of the times. Some of them we don't, but we do choose some of them. One, one peculiar way, how does that go? One peculiar way to die of loneliness is to try. That's Mary. One peculiar way to die of loneliness is to try. Uh, that's sort of what that poem is about. Without my loneliness, I would be more lonely, says Marianne Moore, so I keep it. Oh, this is the wrong book. This poem, uh, I grew up in West Texas, so I'm going to jump to West Texas, uh, a little town called Snyder. This is set outside of Abilene. I, I grew up working in the oil fields. Uh, most everybody I knew worked in the oil fields. Um, and for a while, I forget where we were, uh, um, where we were doing this, but uh, we were paving things, and, and my job was to drive the steamroller. And I was 16 years old, and this seemed to me an incredibly cool job. It was not a little, little steamroller, it was a huge steamroller. And when you were driving the steamroller, it was hot, hot as hell. The, the, the best thing that could happen would be to see a snake. Because of course, you can figure it out. That's what this poem is about, native. At 16, 16 miles from Abilene, Trent, to be exact, hell bent on being not this, not that. I drove a steamroller smack dab over a fat black snake. Up surged a cheer from men so cheerless, cheers were grunts, squints, whisker twitches. It would take a lunatic acuity to see. I saw the fat black snake smashed flat as the asphalt flattening under all ten tons of me, flat as the landscape I could see no end of, flat as the affect of distant killing vigilance it would take a native to know was love. I lived in Chicago for 11 years. This is set in Chicago. My wife and I bought a house right before the market crashed and lost a ton of money. And this is set from the looking out the window of that house. It's called It Takes Particular Clicks. It's just someone sitting at looking out the window uh, at what's going on. Flip-flops, leash clinks, spit on the concrete like a light slap. Our dawn goon ambles past, flexing his pit bull. And soft and soon, a low burn lights the flight path from O'Hare. Slowly the sky, a roaring flew to heaven, slowly shut. Here's a curse for a car door stuck for the umpteenth time. Here a rake for next door's nut to claw and claw at nothing. My nature is to make of the speed bump scraping the speeder's undercarriage and the ohm of traffic and somewhere the helicopter hovering over snarls, a kind of clockwork from which all things seek release but it takes particular clicks to pique my poodle's interest, naming with her nose's particular quiver the unseeable, unsayable squirrel. Good girl. <laughs> Lord is not a word. Song is not a salve. Suffer the child who lived on sunlight and solitude. Savor the man 
craving earth like an aftertaste. To discover in one's hand two local stones the size of a dead man's eyes saves no one, but to fling them with a grace you did not know you knew, to bring them skimming, homing over blue, is to discover the river from which they came. Mild, merciful amnesia through which I've moved as through a blue atmosphere of almost and was. How is it now, like ruins unearthed by ruin, my childhood should rise? Lord, suffer me to sing these wounds by which I am made and marred. Savor this creature whose aloneness you ease and are. In the middle of the road, there was a stone. There was a stone in the middle of the road. There was a stone in the middle of the road. There was a stone. Never should I forget in the life of my fatigued retinas. Never should I forget that in the middle of the road, there was a stone. There was a stone in the middle of the road. In the middle of the road, there was a stone. That's Brazil. Carlos Drummond de Andrade. Uh, translated by Elizabeth Bishop, actually. I just read it for the first time this week, and I just stuck in my head. I love it. This is in uh, East Africa, Western Tanzania. It's a little piece of prose. I wrote it years ago, but I just put it in my new book. I sometimes sit on things for many years, and this is one of them. I won't tell you anything about it because it sort of... Uh, depends for its effect upon, its, upon the surprise. It's one we can probably only read once. The river. In the river where we've stopped, something is moving. Something is alive and writhing in the dark water toward me in Africa in the middle of the day. I can see the baked clay puzzling up the bank, the troubled shadows of the trees. I can see across the water two huge rocks sliding suddenly from the black mud, two pairs of eyes gliding against the stream. It is coming clearer. It is very hot. In the middle of the river drifting, in the current seething slowly closer, 20 of them, 30 of them, crocodiles feeding. I can see the stiff feet and the ripped flanks, the oils and the entrails, the pinkish half-punctured gut of the small hippo bobbing in the water, slash and slash of red. I can see the weave and coil as if the water flexed itself, each welted crocodile taking turn, taking hold, swiveling from head to tail to tear the flesh, and then the sudden satin of its open throat. So slow, this current, almost imperceptible, its tug. It's going to take a long time for this to pass, blood in the water, blood on the banks and in the leaves. It's going to take a long time before the gross bloat and wreck of the carcass curves out of sight. Trees retrieve their shadows on the water, and my father, whom I have almost forgotten, breaks this silence. We really saw that, all these crocodiles, 30 crocodiles eating a baby hippo, drifting down this river where no one was, no one ever goes. Pretty freaky. Uh, this poem is back in Texas. It's called Five Houses Down. Um, this guy's real. It seems to hurt me. Everything I'm reading tonight is real. It's not often the case, but the uh, only thing you need to know about this poem is uh, Sapper is someone who diffuses bombs, goes out there and diffuses bombs, and I use that word for him. Oh, well, we, we, there, worm dirt is a, um, a word that I use here, I make up, I guess, but um, when I grew up, 
uh, people would get a cattle trough, usually a cattle trough or something, and fill it with dirt and, and then put a lot of worms in there so that worms, you could always have worms for fishing. This guy had one. My grandfather had one. Lots of people had them. Five houses down. This is my Ars Poetica. I loved his tin demented chickens and the hell-eyed dog, the mailbox shaped like a huge green gun. I love the eyesore opulence of his five partial cars, the wonder-cluttered porch with its oil-spill plumage, tools called in oil, the dark clockwork of disassembled engines, christened sweet baby and benedicted old bitch. And down the steps into the yard, the explosion of mismatched parts and black scraps amid which, like a bad sapper cloaked in luck, he would look up stunned, patting the gut that slopped out of his undershirt and saying, son, you looking to make some scratch. All afternoon, we'd pile the flatbed high with stacks of Exxon floor mats mysteriously stenciled with his name. Rain-rotted sheetrock or miles of misfitted pipes, coil after coil of rusted fence wire that stained for days every crease of me, rollicking it all to the dump where, while he called every ragman and ravened junk dog by name, he cat-picked the avalanche of trash and fished some always fixable thing up from the depth. His endless, aimless work was not work, my father said. His bark-like earthquake curses were not curses, for he could goddamn a slipped wrench and shit fuck a stuck latch, but one bad word from me made his whole being twang like a nail, misstruck. Ain't no call for that, son. No call at all. Slip not. What not? Not from which no man escapes. Prestoed back to plain old rope, whip snake, black snake, deep in the worm dirt, worms like the clutch of mud. I wanted to live forever, five houses down in the womanless rooms a woman sometimes seemed to move through, leaving him twisting a hand-stitched dish towel or idly wiping the volcanic dust. It was heaven to me. Beans and weenies from paper plates, black-fingered tinkerings on the back stoop as the sun set, on an upturned fruit crate, a little jam jar of rye like ancient light, from which, once, I took a single secret sip, my eyes tearing and my throat on fire. I'm going to end with two poems. This is by uh, me. Uh, the last one won't be. Um, it's, on, it's in your programs. Um, this was set in the Pacific Northwest where my, uh, I lived for a while. And then um, we took our family out there. I have two girls, who are twin girls who are five years old now. We went out there. Um, I guess it's a couple of, they were They were two and a half. It's been a while. Um, and one night, we have this ritual when I put them to bed and I say, you know, uh, give them a kiss good night. I say, I love you, and they say, I love you back. And one night, one of the girls, Fiona, did not say anything. And this was unusual. And, and so I, you know, I didn't know what to do. I said, do you love me too, Fiona, stupidly? <laughs> and uh, nothing. You know, she just stared at, the, stared at the ceiling blankly. And I said, well, Fiona, I love you. Good night. I'll see you in the morning. And then as I was going to stand up, she put her hand on me and like a little Lauren Bacall said, I will love you in the summertime. I will love you in the summertime. <laughs> and <laughs> two years old. And, you know, I, I told my mom about this and she was, she was almost wept or she was, she was so upset by it. But I, I was so proud. You know, I, my, I thought my heart was just going to break with pride for her because it just seemed to be such a piercing, poetic thing to say. I will love you in the summertime. Genius. Um, this poem is called Witness. Uh, it was a magical summer for us because we'd had a lot happen. I'd been sick and we'd had a lot happen. Typically cryptic, 
God said three weasels slipping electric over the rocks, one current conducting them up the tree by the river in the woods of the country into which I walked away and away and away. And a moon-blued, cloud-strewn night sky like an x-ray with here a mass and there a mass and everywhere a mass and to the tune of a two-year-old storm of atoms elliptically, electrically alive, I will love you in the summertime, Daddy. I will love you in the summertime. Once in the West, I lay down dying to see something other than the dying stars so singularly clear, so unassailably there, they made me reach for something other. I said, I will not bow down again to the numinous ruins. I said, I will not violate my silence with prayer. I said, Lord, Lord, in the speechless way of things that bear years and hard weather and witness. And this last poem is by Osip Mandelstam. It's the last poem he ever wrote, or he wrote three on the last day that we have poems uh, by him, but I like to think this is the last one. I spent a lot of time thinking about Mandelstam and translated a little, little book of his poems with Ilya Kaminsky a few years ago. And I was alive amid the blizzard of the blossoming pear. Myself I stood in the storm of the bird cherry tree. It was all leaf life and star shower, unerring, self-shattering power, and it was all aimed at me. What is this dire delight, flowering, fleeing, always earth? What is being? What is truth? Blossoms rupture and rapture the air, all hover and hammer, time intensified and time intolerable sweetness, raveling rot. It is now. It is not. Thank you all very much. Thank you.